there onwards, nobody has to see. Goes to the particular postman that delivers. So this process really, this was a major use in, at the industrial level. And then you've got uh, the, the concept of uh, deep network or deep learning. And I'll talk about deep learning a little bit. That uh, very famous uh, professor at the University of Toronto, Hinton who actually started all that. And then, of course, you have another very, you know, this requires really a lot more work than this, this one requires. Because here you know the game, right? It's described. There, in, in this case, actually, how many have, of you have seen Jeopardy in some form? So Jeopardy is, is a TV show where there are categories defined and the questions, so I think you, you're given an answer. What's the second largest city in Karnataka? You have to say Mangalore, right? Is this the largest city? Uh, my story is, which is the second largest city? So, so, so actually, so I'll say, I'll say size of the city would be category and, and I'll say Bangalore, you say largest city in, in Karnataka. So you actually, uh, no, what you would say, what is the largest city in Karnataka? So you'll give the question to me, and I'll give you answer before. And, and this is every category. You've got the categories. It could be capitals of the world. It could be uh, movies. It could be uh, uh, sort of pictures, you know, movies, movies and, and actors, and you know, sort of mathematical problems. It could be anything. So this is much more complex now. Your domain is not limited to a game. Because if it's limited to chess, it, it has the brute, brute force it can get to, to multiple stages. But if it's limited, it's unlimited. So it has to read all the stories. It could be story from today. So it has to read all those stories, get some uh, thinking and all that. And, and so this is really a major, major achievement. And what is important, though, the, the last one here is, I think, uh, uh, we have arrived to a point in AI where I think uh, the, the, uh, it's the relationship between machine and human. So one, one very other simple example is uh, there's a cancer which is called pancreatic cancer. It's actually developing pancreas. And it's a very fast developing cancer. The survival rate is very, very, very small. Because by the time the doctors diagnose it, it's already late. So one of the goals is really how do you test early on for pancreatic cancer? This uh, researcher at Microsoft Research, there was a team at uh, Columbia, they looked at the last six months of the Google searches for the people who developed pancreatic cancer at time zero right. Let's assume 100,000 people have developed it. And you go back and see what kind of questions, what kind of searches they have done. From those searches, you develop some intelligence. So you don't know, you don't have any modeling. That's where the deep learning comes automatically. It's not really mapping if then it's learning itself. And the, there's a scientific paper that came out, but there's also a New York Times at an article. About 40% of the cases they can predict, which is a huge number. So if they can predict uh, four months before the symptoms came out, and the doctors could say, go and get the testing done, the chances of survival in Jesus quite a bit. So think about it. I mean, there's no, just looking at, Basically, day-to-day -day symptoms, most of us don't want to go to doctors. We just do a thing, you know, I had a uh, headache this morning, I come up at this time, this and all, so on. The false positive is probably better than not, because if it's not there, you're fine. There will be more tests, you know, there would be, they probably would say, these 100 people have chances of developing prostate cancer, pancreas cancer. And uh, about 20 of those really have an initial stage. So 
So you have saved a tremendous number of lives and suffering. And, and this is, but the question here is not just the robots doing things or machines doing things, it's the interface with the doctor. And that's important to It's the relationship between the human and the machine that must be very, very important. Just think about it, I mean, how many other things we can really warn people with? If we had data, I mean, this is the, when I, the, 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 the scientist's name is Eric Horowitz, and he's, he's doing talk at Buffalo, and when he talked about it, I mean, you can think about, the paper was not out yet, so he talked about it, and it's amazing that you would never think that you just go and look at the Google searches for the people. And they are giving you the information about your health. So, so this is a, this could be tremendous help, actually. As I said uh, here, this is a, a sort of a, this is easier to do because you can actually do more computation than a human being can do. It's 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 happening more often because the machines are faster now. Because now you could actually uh, have the machines look at the uh, machines how they have changed, how much operations can they do, and how quickly they are really changing in terms of the uh, number. You know, you could do one operation in 1940, and now you can do a pair of flops and so on, right? So because of that, your thinking process really, you know, the, the machines can almost go through your uh, you know, same, same speed as your thinking process. But still you got right now one-tenth of the human brain. How much human brain can do and how much machines can do. We still have to go a long way to be able to think and process at that speed. Sorry for this, but this is the only way I can show you. This is from a publication, which, uh, so you have to lie on the floor to, to see that. <laughs> but uh, this is sort of, uh, yeah, this, uh, what, 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 uh, uh, what the machines will outperform humans. So they are saying that by 2020, you don't have to fold your laundry to do better job. Uh, you have uh, uh, translating languages to do much better job. In fact, uh, if you look at the uh, Translate app, actually, it does fairly good job. Many people going to different countries now rely on that. It's, it does a pretty good job. Uh, if you look at the uh, writing high school essays, so, so we can uh, fool our high school teachers, maybe not the college teachers yet, but by this time, they, they, they could write high school essays, and by 2027, they would be driving trucks. Actually, uh, this is one of the industries that's more concerned in the U.S. because the self-driving trucks are developing much faster than any other business because Again, these are going from point A to B, well-defined path, They're not human beings. They're driving, our cars go all over the place. The trucks really are going one place to the other, so it's easier probably to do it. Uh, by uh, 2049, they're predicting uh, uh, best-selling books could be really coming up, and you would not know who wrote it. We didn't know those, those four essays who wrote and, uh, uh, working as a surgeon. Actually, it does work as a surgeon, but there's a lot of assistance right now. So, so, so really, there's a lot of robotic surgery, but the human beings are guiding those surgeries. There would be a lot more in that area, actually. Uh, for farming, they're thinking that we might be able to do math research. And uh, uh, AI will be able like, to do all human tasks. So that's, uh, Probably I'll take back this. Uh, <laughs> they may not be able to do all this. Now that we are on uh, machine side, let's see what happens uh, at this uh, animation. How the jobs, you know, how how we all will be replaced by those red robots by 2060. Isn't that a frightened sort of uh, thinking? 
By the way, this happened, uh, similar thing people talked about during the agricultural revolution or mechanical revolution. You know, people thought that you know, everybody would be without jobs. So, so this is really, uh, uh, you know, what happens when people are thinking about this is what might happen. Now, having done all this, let's figure out how do they do it. What's in there? So if you think about uh, most of the systems, they have this knowledge base, and you actually do a if then, right? And these are expert systems. You say, uh, uh, if this, then this. So you, you sit down with the doctor and say, okay, he's headache. And he's also having a upset stomach. He probably has a flu. And you diagnose. So, so really you've got the if then clauses, very hard to scale it up. Because then you, you have to really get every rule defined. You're still going to miss some. And so, so this really is, uh, it cannot really uh, do any kind of exponential learning. I mean, no scaling there. And cannot, you, know, you cannot code common sense. How do you code it? So it handles some uncertainty in the interference machine, it, it's symbolic reasoning, and then you go to the natural language understanding and it, you can explain the decision. So the other way to do it is really think about a statistical classifier. It's classified into groups. So you basically say it's like the uh, expert system, but it actually learns itself as well. So you have to make it learn. You say, this is going to fall in this category, this classification. This one is going to fall in this classification. And the machine sees what properties those things have. And the new item coming in is going to classify into one other. Very simple, right? I mean, it's really a simple part. There's some mathematics behind it. You need to learn some statistics to do all this. So my statistics degree was helpful. The, uh, then you've got the neural network. So the idea really is uh, you've got uh, all kinds of sensors coming in. So this is how human being works. They have the uh, sort of some level of uh, uh, neurons here. They fire and actually take place, right? Same thing here. You've got data coming in. It takes some weighted average and then it fires. So basically, let me give an example here. So you might have an input layer here, which has, so this is about uh, housing prices. How do you determine the house price? This example is for US centric, so here with me. Basically, uh, the idea is that you give us input, which this is your square footage, right? So this is, uh, then you give the zip code, where a person lives in, and you get the, how old the house is. You only provide these three data. And of course, you have some learning data, gives you the price of the house and so on. But the machine keeps learning and it determines a lot of other hidden layers. In this is the deep learning. It automatically figures out that the other things that are important, for example, you know, what's the family size in this neighborhood? Is it walking distance of places? What kind of schools they have? Not providing directly, but machine to your classification is able to provide other hidden parameters and then it outputs the price. So in case of the expert system, you have to give every, all of this into this input. And then you say, if this, then this. So if the house price, house size is 4,000 square feet, it's in the posh neighborhood in Bangalore, the zip code, it was built Two years ago, if the school is good here and all that, then you do that. But these are really sort of secondary parameters which also determine that they're based on the zip code, but they actually influence. So the program itself has hidden layer, and that hidden layer and the parameters here could change. And that's where the real learning comes, and this is how these become really much, much smarter programs.
questions? So, so there are many models of the uh, broad-based paradigms. Uh, they are symbolic models, Bayesian. There are evolutionary models, and there are analogies. And actually, you know, uh, as you get deeper into that, you'd learn that there's a lot of similarity. The best, I mean, the most famous right now is based on Bayesian, and it's actually uh, more on the deep learning. So, so I'm not going to get into that. The learning, as I talked to you about. Uh, is really, uh, uh, you, sort of, you might actually think about dividing, so if you look at the, uh, the, these points here, initially you have them divided into these two groups. As more data come in, you might actually figure out that it is a straight line actually. You change your boundary. So machine is learning that these points, the blue points are coming in, they're much similar to each other than these points. And so you have only two classifications here. In this case, actually, the three different groups that you begin with, as you get more data, you figure out that they're really in two groups, and not a similar feature. So the learning is dynamic. You don't have a fixed number of parts to put them in. They really learn from each other, and they're based on the properties. And they say they, they belong to these groups. So there's also, I mean, this supervised learning, which is this, this unsupervised learning. In the supervised learning, you actually tell them how the things are divided. Unsupervised learning, it learns itself. So the, this is the sort of uh, uh, how the applications I talked about earlier with Will. So basically it says, if x, then y. So you have a spanning email filter. Basically says, if uh, if it's coming from the Nigerian pins, it's a spam. And there's a famous spam where the message from the Nigerian pins who has money who wants to give it to you. All he needs is your bank account. So, so this is really a very, the, the other message is not. They're much smarter now. But this is, if you say if there's a Nigerian pins anywhere in the email, it's a spam. Uh, you might say it's speech and text uh, Transcription, you know, you look at the waves and you look at the, the, the speech coming in and you recognize the speech that this is this kind of, this is this kind of speech. You uh, object recognition, same thing. You recognize an object in similar fashion. Uh, humor detection. Whatever you're doing really, it's uh, taking the AI and making a commodity out. And this is all happening as we see. So why has it happened now? AI has been there for 60, 70 years, was popular in the early 80s, and it faded. Well, it's happening because we have a lot more data coming from a lot of different places. It wasn't, as data wasn't available as, even if it was, you couldn't get access to it. So there's a lot more chance to learn. The more data you have, the more learning you can do. <coughs> It's cheap storage, you can store almost everything. On your iPhone, you never delete a picture. You can store almost everything you want. You got the big data that actually, as a field, trying to determine and trying to analyze things. And you got the fast processors. So electrical, electronics, they are playing role in it. You got the uh, processors that are really uh, very, very fast and they can process things in no time. Because AI is very computation intensive. It's data is intensive as well. So you couldn't do these things before. Even if the technology was there, wasn't useful. And then, of course, the whole concept of the deep neural network. And deep neural network is a separate course, which I don't know about. You should be, uh, if you are interested, you should sort of at least uh, See if it's available online. And see if you want to do it. Actually, it's, it's, it's a good course no matter where you do the uh, your your uh, what area you want to work. So this confluence of, of technology, where uh, the storage, the uh, sort of uh, computation, the abundance of data from everywhere, and uh, 
for the uh, growth that has happened in the neural network has given rise to really some very good applications. And uh, it is uh, really uh, time has come together where they can, they, they can be used. So pattern recognition basically takes the input. Of course, many of you do pattern recognition, I know, I'm taking towards AI. It does take certain features. So it tries to define what features a car has, takes features, and then it builds a classification. And then you give a new input to the uh, classification algorithm. It says, is this car or not a car? human being or not. Now, it has here, it takes the input as a car, it doesn't have the same human interface. It actually has feature extraction and classification by itself, and then it says whether the output is car or not. Because the human aspect of it makes it slow, makes it limited, makes it non scalable so this is what the change that has happened in terms of the user. Uh, there are also, how do you explain certain things? When your car is going, how do you figure out exactly how deep? And there are actually now research programs, programs available where you don't have to, you know, just give the car to actually get to the model as well. Actually, if you think about Facebook, this might probably be the same. So you can explain what you have. So these are different terms. Human in the loop. For example, uh, if you think about uh, diagnosis, uh, if, if you think about the, uh, uh, the, the pathologists, the pathologists are the doctors who uh, get your uh, blood sample, uh, culture, cell culture and all that, and they try to determine if there's some problem. The lot of it actually can be automated. But determining whether somebody has cancer or not could be automated, but we still don't feel like giving it to the uh, machine. So while the machine learns from the doctor, the doctor is also learning from the and that's the partnership I think that's going to survive, where it's really the partnership between human and machine. And it's a continuous partnership where we keep learning from each other. There are the issues with these things. So there could be biases and, and ethics issues. You know, if uh, think about uh, a lot of the learning could take place, initial learning could take place from certain population. Maybe all of this could take place from the people who are rich. You know, in the U.S., it may not contain the minorities. And then you become that your rules are based on a small group of population that doesn't represent everyone. So that actually, you know, whether uh, give this person a license or not, or give this person, uh, uh, this person might have a cancer or not, it's also dependent on a lot of issues, and this could be biased. Right? A lot of times the confidence is not there. I mean, a, a, a mother may not like that this child can be operated only by robot. And this is what they have to do. Rather than having a second opinion, they may not like that. The confidence needs to be built in. The whole issue of civil liberties, and we are talking about the Aadhaar card here in India, and what it can really face. When, when we sign any kind of agreement on the internet when you buy an app or you do something, you don't even think about it. You know, we never read those contracts. How many ever have written, uh, read a contract on that? Any software, anything that you have to come with? You just don't think about the information you're giving and the kind of surveillance that could be done. And how do you, some aspects you have to do. But how do you separate the bad guys from the good guys? The data that's being used. And AI is 
actually make it even harder. Decisions on you will be made because they have collected data on you. Who won't even know? So when you go for a job, they already know that they're not going to give you a job <laughs> because you're posting too many things or something else. But the point is that there is really danger in terms of relying on this. Of course, we talked about this. And the cyber security, and then again, uh, I think the data in our heart we are saying is the compromise and so on. But, uh, you know, once we want the, uh, the, the, the benefits of it, there would be some pitfalls. You can't completely separate the two. And I think we have to be, we have to be mindful of the fact that there are problems with technology. But there's no way to really avoid it. There's no way. I mean, think about, you know, so one of the examples uh, for, of our work, really, which is very interesting, uh, uh, one of the students, our students, uh, actually was the uh, chief bureaucrat for that, uh, Dr. Sharma, who's now the uh, uh, TRI head. He was a student in California when I was there. And uh, said that the saving in the gas connection was enough to have the, uh, the, the unique identifier project go on for 10 years, in one year. So people in India, of course, you, you know this better than I do, uh, you know, people had fake names with uh, gas connection, right? They had gas cylinders because they were all subsidized. So not only everybody in the family, but other people, you know, dogs and so on, we all had gas cylinders. And uh, just by connecting that to your unique ID, the government was able to save enough money that it can run the hard program to help. Just one year. So the, the abuse that goes on because you know we, we sort of uh, have these uh, uh, different identities that could be completely avoided. Of course, the other side is there too, but the point is then you have to determine what is good for everybody and not for individuals. You've got to have the societal good there as well. So, so definitely this is a list of social goods. I mean, uh, the kind of surgeries that could be done with, without really affecting, you know, without completely opening somebody's brain or somebody's uh, heart. You can do a lot of work there. The environment, you know, not just that the unmanned vehicle could just go and, and find out uh, the enemy side, but you can really protect the environment. You can think about getting into the areas where you can't get in. Uh, you can think about the students' handwriting, whether they wrote their essays or not. Actually, you know, uh, even if you are uh, submitting an essay, and I know you as a student, and you can't even say five sentences, and your essay is fantastic, I should be able to analyze that and say this is really a, not a written by this person. So you could do a lot of work actually. You can predict that I said the cancer patient prognosis. Uh, you can actually predict protein-protein interaction to improve the crop yield. I mean, there's a lot of really good stuff in here. And uh, we, we are working on the, the one that slightly yellow, we have actually people working on these in Buffalo. Many scientists are working on this. So there's a lot of social good. So we have a human machine partnership institute we're forming, and the goal really is that the understanding should be on both sides. And we would develop educational program and certification degrees. Uh, we have a lot of pressing problems in the industry. How do we do that? Uh, and, and the idea really is to focus and press the idea of the human and machine interface. Not this or the other one. But how can we make the quality of life better with the two working together? So this is our goal for the institute that you're forming. So I've got about uh, 12, 13 minutes. I could keep talking, but what I want really is to uh, give you just one example. And then I'm going to ask questions. So, so AI at, at UB at Buffalo really involves 
people from <coughs> different disciplines. We have humanities people, physical sciences, computer science, of course, engineering, life sciences, and medicine, and social sciences, all coming together. You know, it's not just the technology issue. It's the society issue. You've got to bring people together. And, and that's why it's important that when we study these, our, our curriculum to be broader than concentrating on very narrow fields, because due to interacting with people who are from different disciplines. This is something that I talked about the uh, US Postal Service. Uh, this is a large project, many years, and saved a lot of money. That's going on at, at Buffalo. Face recognition. So when the, uh, if you remember, there was a major fiasco bombing in, in Boston Marathon. And uh, there were uh, sort of many people who died there. Uh, there were pictures available from different cameras, individual cameras, lots of pictures available. So there's a project uh, from Department of Defense and NSF that Buffalo and University of Maryland are still finishing. Is really how do you, and you got really thousands of faces here, small pictures. How do you recognize those? And in time, can you really move those faces from one place to the other? That way you can see the movement of the people. And you might be able to in person. So really, intelligence coming in there. That's a project that's going on there. Uh, face expression. How do you know somebody's happy, somebody's not happy? How do you know somebody's lying? We have a faculty member in the Department of Communication who actually specializes if somebody's lying or not. And he goes and, uh, and actually trains the custom and immigration officials. So when people come in and they ask questions, if they're lying, it's not that you can say for sure, but at least you can do more investigation. So, so really, uh, can you do that in an automated fashion? How do you do that? So there's work going on. Again, National Science Foundation is part of the defense work. There's actually a smart sword that, that you know, the uh, work that, uh, that Amazon has done, where you go to the store, you have a card, you don't have to talk to anybody, you get things from the store, it automatically gets money from your, uh, your card and you get out. So this is all automated. It has to recognize you, it has to recognize your card, it has to recognize what you take out. But the other applications for that as well. And uh, one of the things that I'll talk a little bit more maybe uh, tomorrow, I get time, is uh, how do you accelerate the discovery process? How do you accelerate your research process? Uh, one area that we are funded right now to work at is material science. There are a lot of papers that come out. You can automate the abstract. Somebody could read the abstract. But then you still have most of the information is really in the graphs. In many of the science papers actually have to read the graphs and tables. And that's one of the hardest things to do automatically. So this program actually is, is developing, and, and, and this is trying to read the papers automatically. You know, get the, uh, the graphs, get the, uh, the tables, and if you think about it and, and analyze papers, similar papers, and give you a gist of things. So if it is really important, you go read it. Otherwise, a thousand paper a day coming out, you would be completely lost in doing it. This can accelerate the new discovery because you know what is already done and what's going to be work happening later on. So this is a project that actually is, 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 is uh, of course, like everybody else, we have self-driving programs. And, uh, Precision medicine also is very important because most of the medicine is developed for general masters, right? I mean, any medicine you take, that's not for you, particular body. It's for people like us. In fact, the, one of the problems that many of the trials is that uh, many of the, uh, you know, sort of our bodies from different ethnic groups and the, the genes are totally different and they react to medicine differently. So how do we really learn from the data that we have and have precision medicine? In fact, you know, I should also call it individualized medicine. One of the things we are looking at in the university setting is how do you 
provide individualized education. So the idea is that you're not here, you are admitted to a program and you are in the program. But in the US actually, you can join an undergraduate program in, in physics and a year later you say, I don't, I don't like this, I'm going to go in engineering. Or you can say, I'm going to go in business. You change. But if you, let's assume you join physics and the first year you fail your math course. And you say, no, no, I'm going to take the course again. I'm going to continue in physics. You could develop a program where it monitors the students and says that, oh, you want to go to medicine, but you're failing organic chemistry ones? There's no way you're going to get admitted anywhere. And advises you to think about a different path for you to succeed. Or it actually, if you said that you wanted to do physics, but you're taking courses that doesn't lead to physics degree, it says, no, 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 you've got to be on this track. So, and it has individual, your, your, your status, your data, and all that, and tells you how to proceed. So some of the work that in the US that a lot of these academic advisors do could be automated. You only go to, and, you know, think, like, think about uh, a navigation system. When it gives you a path to go, and you take a wrong turn, it says recalculate. Gives you another path to reach your destination. Same way you can think about this education system. So there's a lot of work actually on individualized uh, uh, education system as well that's going on. <coughs> there's digital humanities, there's work in the humanities as well. And I'm gonna stop here. I've got a lot more work here, but you get the gist of it. So thank you, and I'll be happy to answer questions.